Hi, and welcome to Gartner Live. Today we're talking about a topic that's on many leaders' minds, how to reinvent the way work gets done. Employees have been working differently for more than a year, and many are resistant to returning to old ways of working. What's at stake for leaders and organizations at this specific moment in time to change the way we work? I'm Heather Pemberton-Levy, Vice President of Content Marketing at Gartner. Joining me today are Chris Howard, Gartner Chief of Research, and Alexia Cambon, Research Director in Gartner's HR Research Practice. Welcome, Chris and Alexia. Hi, Heather. Hi, Heather. We're glad to have you here. Let's start with some context setting. Why is this such a pivotal moment in time for leaders in their organizations, and what do they need to consider right now? Chris, why don't you start us off? Sure, you bet. So we're all facing a decision right now around how do we return to workplaces? How do we return to some kind of a, of a normal? And it's actually a really complex decision if you think about where we've been and where we are. So prior to the pandemic, we were working in certain ways and had certain habits and assumptions. And then all of a sudden we had to pivot to mostly remote for a lot of workers. And we've been that way now for the last 15 months or more. And we have a choice to make. We can either go back to what we were doing before, or we can take this moment as an opportunity to actually reimagine what work itself is and to invent new styles of working and to really take into consideration preferences of the employees, but also different ways of creating value. And I know that Alexia and the team have been studying some of these assumptions that have broken and starting to see data. So Alexia, how do you think about these assumptions and ways of thinking about the, the new style of work? Yeah, sure. It's a great question. And you know, we've been researching this for probably coming up to eight, nine months now, and it really became apparent to us very quickly just how much of the way we work has been inherited from prior eras. And it's actually something you can't unsee once you see it. And I want to give three examples of that that impact the whole cycle of work. So the when, the how, and the where. And Probably starting with the when, if you think our classic schedule of work is nine to five. When we first started researching where nine to five came from, it was actually implemented during the industrial era um, because manufacturers needed hours of natural daylight. And those were most likely to occur between the hours of nine to five. You know, we didn't have electricity back then. So obviously nine to five became the when of work. Uh, you know, we have electricity. Most of us are no longer on the manufacturing belt. So why are we still insisting on holding on to this legacy schedule? Um, the other one I felt was super interesting was the how of work, which is so many of us, I think, especially this last year, have just suffered from the back-to-back -back schedule of meetings, just constantly sitting in on these virtual calls. And we understood that we've really been operating in this culture of meetings. For, for decades and, and we started looking at when did this culture of meetings really start? And you know, it really grew pace in the 1950s because sending out a memo, you know, doing work asynchronously just took a really long time. Um, so the idea of work gets done in a meeting was kind of solidified at that point and we've carried it through now to the remote and virtual setting we've been operating in but again we have all the asynchronous tools we need so why are we insisting on on that how of work as a default mode and then i think the the third one the where which is probably the most relevant for this conversation right now you know, the office has historically been treated as the HQ of work. And I think even the term to work remotely suggests that you are working away from something, that you are away from where work gets done. But again, for so many of us now, as we've proven over the last year, work can be done anywhere. So why are we insisting on holding on to the office as the HQ of work? You know, this very location centric mentality. So I think those are some of the things that we're starting to see as we're trying to understand why we work the way we do and why right now this moment in time is a real opportunity for us to rethink a lot of how we work and to really question those assumptions. 
It's really interesting to think about concepts like remote work and the office's headquarters and that mindset that's a legacy mindset. Uh, one of the terms that's been getting a lot of press and we've been talking about it a lot is this concept of hybrid work where you're mingling remote work with office work. And we have some compelling data points that may point to a trend like this, which is that when Gartner surveyed 4,000 employees, 39% of them said they were likely to leave if organizations insist on a hard return to or a wholesale return to a fully on-site experience. Is that really likely to happen? Uh, I think it's yes, but with a certain type of worker. And the, the thing is that these are workers that are in high demand. And so if you, for example, you think of people that have data science skills or you know, modern architecture skills for technology, for example, these are the type of, of people for which the market is really hot right now. And they're being pursued by companies that don't actually don't have a location requirement. And so if you're forcing, for example, in a major center like London or New York or Toronto or somewhere like that, for people to come back to a traditional office setting, you're going to face really stiff competition in the market for people that can have them located anywhere. And so the, the Threat, the threat is very real of, of the loss of these people, and they're really strongly considering where they're going. But I think it brings us to an interesting point, which is, have we just shifted all the way to, you know, to, to an overemphasis on employee focus or human focus, uh, or are we actually seeing a reason to engage employees in a different way because it produces a different type of result? And so you're, so you're actually shifting your strategies based on what employees need to be happy and productive and motivated. And Alexia, you're seeing data that actually ties you know, employee motivation and their flexibility to real business outcomes, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's interesting the point you mentioned there about a perception we had prior to the pandemic about remote work and remote working equating to a loss of control for organization, which in turn they felt equated to a loss of productivity. And that's just not the case. We haven't seen any adverse impact on productivity in the last year uh, in the data. What we have seen is that expectations for flexibility have vastly increased. 75% um, of knowledge workers now say that they um, want to work flexibly and that their expectations for that have increased. And only 4% really want to go back to a full, um, full time on site arrangement. And when we look at why it makes a lot of sense because when you give employees more flexibility they are actually higher performers according to our data they are three times more likely to be high performers when they have flexibility over how where and when they work and i think that really demonstrates um, this very clear understanding that when you allow employees to create the work patterns that make them productive that make them healthy and happy then they will work better for you. Uh, it is not about a loss of control. It is about empowerment. Um, and I think similarly, you know, we we had a lot of concern in our conversations um, with organisations about, you know, it's all good to give employees flexibility and the power to set their own work patterns, but that's going to have a real adverse outcome on innovation, on collaboration. And so we set out to try and see if that were true. And what we're also finding is that when you enable intentional collaboration, when you enable teams to decide when and where and how they come together and at what moments in time, you're actually more likely to see high levels of innovation because distributed teams have to think a lot more intentionally about when they come together to be innovative. So. You know, all of this to say that what we're seeing is that those organizations that are adopting a more human centric design, and that really means designing work around humans, around what makes them productive, healthy and happy, um, rather than a location centric design where you're designing around a place, you will see a boost in intent to stay. Uh, an increase in performance and critically a reduction in fatigue, which is becoming a real risk right now uh, after a month of, you know, virtual ways of working and, and all of the adverse outcomes that the pandemic has had on our mental health. So there are a couple of things that I want to just underline that you said. One is that we need to be intentional about the redesign. That's, that's really important. Another is that flexibility does not equal chaos. 
that it actually there is a structure that comes with that. It's just it's a different structure that we need to learn how to manage. So there's a, a learning uh, a, you know, ramp for, for managers there too in terms of dealing with these types of, of teams. Um, and and all of these go to this combination of, of, of feeling of personal outcomes, so human outcomes, as well as business outcomes, as well as value outcomes for the, from the receivers of what you're, you're creating. So it creates this, this cycle of good. And a point I want to really emphasize is that, that what we're learning through this data and other data around, say, corporate social responsibility is that, that doing good is actually really good for business and for people. And that's what really is driving this from, from all of the research that I'm seeing. It's also intriguing to think about what I'm stitching together here, which is these these old ways of working, the meeting cycle you talked about that came from the 50s, right? And then you have people who don't, you know, who who can work differently. The flexibility matters in new ways. So when you add that up, Alexia, you're talking about not just virtualizing old ways of working, but doing something altogether different. I think it's this concept that the two of you and, and the entire research organization that's been working on this have really, has really been looking at and calling it this reinvention. So what else does that entail? How do, how do leaders and organizations start to get their heads around this is completely new way of working because these are new paradigms, right? Completely new models of thinking about constructs for working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that is such a critical point to make is that we cannot simply take the work design of our past, virtualize it and expect that to work in a hybrid environment. That is not going to drive the outcomes you want. And I want to probably cite two specific examples that demonstrate that. And the first is to that point you were mentioning, Heather, about meetings, um, about virtualizing that culture of meetings we had in the office. Um, you know, when we went remote, we saw the majority of organizations really encouraging teams and managers to add more meetings to the books to really make sure that they were staying connected with each other to kind of compensate for that lack of face time that we had in that office centric model. You know, that makes a lot of sense. But this is done on the assumption that a virtual interaction is the same as an in person interaction. And it is not. Uh, we did research to try and understand why virtual interactions are so cognitively draining, because they are. And some of the things we saw was that your brain has to process a lot more information. Uh, one of my favorite findings from a study showed that the place you're most likely looking is on yourself uh, on a virtual call. Um, and if you think about that, if you think about the reality of what that means, when you're an in-person interaction, you're probably unlikely to be having a mirror held up in front of you watching yourself interact with other people. So that is a whole new dimension that your brain has to now grapple with. So that is one example of how just virtualizing the way we did things in the office is not going to, go, is not going to work and is actually going to drive fatigue. Um, another example that I found hugely fascinating um, and quite worrying, to be frank with you, was we had a lot of anxiety when we first started doing this research about the lack of visibility in the hybrid world, that managers and leaders no longer were able to see their employees, to see how they were doing, to see how they were working. And as a result, a huge amount of investment going into monitoring and tracking technologies to try to get some of that visibility back. So again, trying to recreate uh, that office-centric design uh, in the hybrid environment. And what we found was that when you um, add monitoring and tracking to the employee experience, employees suddenly feel the pressure to try to demonstrate that they are working. Uh, you know, in our data, we saw that employees who feel tracked are twice as likely to pretend to be working. Now, that is an actual item we put in our survey. Do you sometimes pretend to be working when you are working remotely? And those employees who felt they were tracked were much more likely to say yes. And so, you know, we've taken that office centric design of visibility, tried to virtualize it, tried to recreate that visibility to regain what we lost. And what it's done is it's just driven behaviors in humans that we don't really want. You know, we don't want employees to feel that they are not trusted, to feel that they have to pretend that they are working, especially in an environment which we know uh, is very hard to disconnect from. Uh, we know that the remote population are working longer hours than their on-site counterparts. 
we know that they are struggling to find the line between personal time and work time. So we should not be incentivizing employees uh, to work longer hours. And so that's another example of how virtualizing old ways of working is causing damage. Um, yeah. Reinventing. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, so so you're, you're spot on. And, and if the future of work means fewer meetings, then I'm all in. <laughs> Because it's, it is exhausting, right? And we're seeing it, you know, in, in populations of all types, whether it be employees, which is kind of the focus of what we're talking about here. But I saw also see it in higher ed or education with students that are on sort of continuous Zoom calls and so on. And the level of burnout is just going higher and higher and higher. And, and what it leads us to and what the team is working on is we actually need to think about designing work for different combinations of people together or individually, as well as uh, working asynchronously versus in a collaborative sense and, and saying what type of work actually fits different scenarios more effectively, which is a very high demand question from Gartner clients right now around uh, where, you know, now the vaccine in, in many parts of the world is starting to, to gain critical mass. We're thinking about reopening our locations. Should we be doing something different in them? What's the type of work that actually fits into those environments? And so when you mentioned intentionality earlier, this is the kind of intentionality we're talking about. Is what kind of work should people be doing at home when they're on their own or on Zoom calls or, or in the office working together? And also some assumptions being broken there. And what I would advise, you know, the people that are listening, is to remember what Alexia said, don't just redesign the work we knew in a digital format, but rather intentionally think about different styles of work and, and what it means for people to be together. And the one other point I would make here too, because you're, you're talking about workforce analytics, for example, and studying people, you know, tracking people, you know, the, these are not, these are optimized for processes and optimized for the business, but not for the, for the people. And so if the, if the finding is that people given flexibility produce more outcome for themselves and for the business, then tracking actually is counterproductive to that, to that goal. But the key is that we don't actually have the tools that we need for the future of work yet. The tools we have are pretty good, but when it comes to much more immersive or even technologies for what you might consider frontline workers, so these are people that never left the workplace that make and move things, for example, there's innovation happening for their type of work too. And so everything's on the table. We have a lot of opportunity to, to reimagine everybody's work, not just the quote unquote knowledge workers, but everybody that's employed and think about what is it that makes them productive as humans in this environment that we call a business. You're talking about a new level of flexibility that stretches across different types of of industries and vocations. And as you said, we don't even have all the tools for it yet. What does that entail? What is that level of flexibility? Because there is some research on how important flexibility is and how do our viewers, uh, organizations start to get their you know, heads and, and arms around this starting now? I'll give it to you first, Alexia. <laughs> yeah, I was just looking to see. Do you already take this one, Chris, or I'll take it? Uh, I'll go first. Yeah, I think for the data piece, for sure, we know 55% uh, of employees have told us um, whether or not they can work flexibly will impact whether or not they stay with their employer. So there's a huge attrition risk, which I think many organizations are seeing already if we don't give them that flexibility. Uh, so I think listening to how an employee would define flexibility for them is already a hugely important first step. Adopting those listening strategies is going to be crucial. Um, I think you know we need to have a huge mindset shift when it comes to flexibility. And this is probably why I keep hearing in conversations uh, with senior leaders uh, about culture. Uh, you know, culture keeps being brought up as the most important part of establishing flexibility as the default not the exception. Uh, and I think that is where we need to get to. We really need to get to a place where we trust employees to create the work patterns that make them productive. And that goes down to even the terms we are using, the language we are adopting. Um, you know, to, to Chris's point before about how we need to start thinking more about working in different ways and different modes being more asynchronous and less synchronous. You know, one of the things I've heard before is um, this, there needs to be this strict delineation between personal and work time. 
and flexibility doesn't really allow for that strict delineation. Uh, I think we need to move away from that. I think we need to acknowledge that doing things like going for a run or meditating or going for a walk are hugely important to driving business outcomes. They allow the employee, especially in this more digital world, to take time away from their screens, to do deep focus work, to recharge. And so whenever I hear one of my team members say, oh, I'm taking personal time, I'm going for a run, I very much encourage them to think of that flexibility as key to their performance. And so moving away from language that suggests that flexible work falls into some kind of binary categorization or language that suggests that flexibility is a, a perk or a reward or something you earn, uh, I think that's a huge mindset shift that needs to happen. Uh, and that means really starting to think about flexibility as a philosophy, not a policy, not something that can be strictly regulated or uh, designed as a one size fits all approach. Flexibility is going to differ hugely from individual to individual. So Heather, there's another dimension here too, of course, which is very real, is that we're still in the midst of the pandemic. And some of this flexibility has to do with you know, environment at home and responsibilities at home that interfere with traditional work hours or work styles. There are issues of, do I feel safe to return to a physical environment just from a health perspective? And there's a whole set of ancillary concerns like around vaccine certifications and passports and things that will give us some level of, of assurance that the, you know, that the choices that we're making are the right ones. And they're complicated choices because they're all trying to figure it out too. <laughs> And, you know, can you mandate vaccines? Can you say open the office to people that have only been vaccinated, but you can't ask about it? It's, it's a very complex set of issues that are really germane to this time. But the key of all of this research and what we're talking about here is that our assumptions have been broken. And if you know, some of you will know that it takes three weeks to break a habit, to break a bad habit. Well, what breaks after a year and a half or more? And, and what I'm finding with, with many of my clients is they're actually looking reflectively back on that and saying, well, what broke that should have been broken and that puts us in a better place? And how do we actually go beyond from, from there? So we've reached this sort of liminal moment where we're all experiencing the same things, but the outcome isn't completely clear yet. That's a giant opportunity to actually reinvent exactly what we want to be and to, and to, to take those things that we've learned and apply them and scale them to, to the future. And that, you know, if I could leave you with any message here, it's really that, is don't miss that opportunity to, to take the data that we're seeing, to check the own assumptions that have changed for you and the patterns that you see working with your own environment and make them stick to become the next foundation for what we do. That's great. So on that, it would be great if you could give us a little bit of overview about the resource center that's been launched because we have a large uh, tiger team in the research organization that's been thinking about this topic across the organization, across every function, because it really does touch most leaders and their organizations. You've launched a resource center for clients with research that stretches across functions. We also have one for the public. So maybe you can talk to us about what that covers. We also will be airing a four episode series, same time, same day, each week over the next uh, four weeks. And so you can tune in next week to learn a little bit more about also returning to the workplace. So, yeah, this is great. So, so when I first we, we've clearly been thinking about this topic for a while because it was some of the earliest questions we had when the pandemic began. But as we're turning this, this corner and thinking about the redesign of work, it was clear that it affected every role that Gartner serves. Uh, and in a couple, of, a couple of specific ways. One is that many of you manage people. So you're thinking of this as a, as a manager and, and, and thinking about reconstituting your workforce physically as, as well as emotionally too, to be important. So, so there's that, but also you often have you know, functions to deliver too that are, that are being affected by this and having to deliver things, deliver things in a more, uh, a more remote or virtual way, like events, for example, with the change we have in, in the, the whole events business itself. And so what we've done is we've created this resource center to expose this research and it's across all of the roles that we have. So from legal and assurance to finance, to HR, clearly to IT for digital enablement and everything in between. And so we've created a story that starts around this idea of location versus human-centric design 
but then we go beyond that and it'll will continue this clearly through the next through 22 at least to tell a story that's broken up into chapters and so alexa maybe you could talk just a little bit about how we've how we've structured the the topics themselves yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, to your point, Chris, this has implications across so many different areas, and we've really looked at it in terms of six key priorities that we know all organizations um, need support in. And so the first is that human-centric work design piece. How do we implement flexibility across the organization? How do we make individual employees more productive by giving them more control over their work conditions and their work environment? Um, the second is very much around uh, reforming the culture. So understanding that organizational culture needs to evolve as well in order to stay relevant and effective in a hybrid and future environment. Um, rethinking the workplace is our third key priority. Obviously, the future of work has massive implications for how we think about our spaces, about our real estate, how they need to change to keep teams more collaborative. Uh, to really help drive that intentional uh, collaboration piece we, we talked about earlier. Um, managing in a hybrid world, this one is, is hugely important to me uh, in particular, uh, really thinking about how does management philosophy need to change? How do we need to rethink the role of the manager to really help drive this more human-centric focus? Right now, a lot of managers are not necessarily set up or incentivized to think about human centricity. So what needs to change there? Um, digital enablement is our fifth key priority, obviously hugely important understanding what are the technologies, the practices that we need to optimize hybrid work in the short term and really fuel organizational prosperity in the long term. Uh, and then finally, our sixth priority, shifting talent and skills. So you know, future of work is gonna require us to rethink uh, the skills, the competencies that employees are going to need in the digital future. There are a lot of uh, macro shifts that are happening in the labor market. Uh, what do we need to bear in mind as we design for those realities? Great. We will be covering these topics each Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern time in this special series. So make sure to tune in next week. In the meantime, you can download complimentary research, read articles, watch webinars and videos by searching for Gartner Future of Work Reinvented or visiting Gartner.com. If you're a client, we've just launched the Resource Center on the client portal. So make sure to check it out. Thank you, Chris and Alexia, and thank all of you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Heather. Thank you.